In this video, I'd like to talk about the bond graph implementation of a uh, shop crane model. It's shown schematically here in this figure. There are some dimensions given. Uh, body 3, which is this horizontal boom, we're going to model that using uh, absolute coordinates or inertial coordinates, fixed i and j directions. So that will require a rigid body with connection points F and E, and point E will be uh, pinned to a fixed reference frame. So in the notes, we will use a generic rigid body for uh, absolute coordinates. So basically this rigid body model right here. And if we collapse that down into a submodel, um, that submodel will have outputs for the velocity of two connection points A and B in uh, inertial X and Y coordinates. Now for the uh, part of the shop crane where there is a rotating sliding joint, that's where use of body fixed coordinates uh, makes things a lot easier. So I'm imagining the actuator, a, tube, uh, a rod inside a tube, as being split into two bodies. Body 2A is the, um, the tube. Body 2B is the rod, each with a center of gravity and a mass and an inertia. Uh, for the, uh, the tube part, I'm going to define a hinge point D, which will be fixed to the uh, reference frame. Uh, and I'll define a point HA, which is an arbitrary point on the tube. And maybe in the beginning of the simulation, point HA on the tube will be coincident with a point HB on the rod. So for the rod, I need to define point HB, and I need to define point F. Point F on the rod is going to be pinned to F on the horizontal boom. So the bodies are 2A and 2B. The reason that body fixed coordinates are useful is because the actuator force inside this cylinder is going to apply an equal and opposite force F along the body fixed I direction at all times, regardless of the orientation angle. Uh, and the sliding joint should do two things. It should make the angular velocities of the two bodies approximately equal to some common value, which I'll call omega-2. And it should also prevent uh, lateral motion of the rod with respect to the tube. So when we look at the velocity of HB with respect to HA, uh, let's see, if I imagine everything pivoting about point D, the velocity of change colors here. The velocity of HA would be distance D HA times omega 2 and point HB a farther distance from D that's going to have a higher you know, tangential velocity. Its velocity would be the distance D HA plus the sliding distance, we'll call that X sliding times omega 2. So the relative velocity, okay, the delta here, that relative velocity VHBY minus VHAY, and that's going to be DHA plus X sliding minus DHA times omega 2. So we're just left with X sliding times omega 2 is the relative velocity. And that's always going to be in the body fixed J direction. All right. So with that particular rotating sliding joint, we're going to have a lot easier time implementing things if we use body fix coordinates. It's possible to do this in inertial coordinates, but getting those sliding and uh, lateral directions always in terms of a fixed I and J direction, horizontal and vertical, uh, is quite challenging. All right, so we have our constraints. Now all that's left, of course, is to bond graph this. Uh, I'm going to apply the force, the actuation force, to a one junction which has a velocity equal to the sliding velocity, which is the velocity of HB minus HA in the rotating X direction. And right now, uh, we're at the 4 minute and 50 second mark, so you can scroll back to here if you want and look at this figure uh, at any time throughout the subsequent bond graph construction. 
Right, on the next page, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of my generic rigid body uh, submodels. Now I'm going to go into 20SIM here. I've pulled off the course web page um, these generic bodies for absolute and body fixed coordinates, and each one of them is going to have velocities of the connection points x and y, and I can also pull out an omega there. So in the absolute formulation of the body, I see the modulated transformers, which make velocity of a in the x direction v g x plus a g sine theta theta dot. And in the body fixed formulation, I see uh, non-modulated transformers, and I see the modulated gyrator structure, which allows us to capture the inner product terms of Euler's equations, or the so-called gyroscopic or Coriolis terms, as they're so-called in robotics sometimes. And I have to transform from the body fixed velocity components to an inertial y direction if I want to apply gravity. So anyway, so for the bond graph that I'm going to sketch here, I'm going to simply begin by taking body 3, and body 3 is the horizontal boom. I'm going to represent it as one of these bond graph submodels. And coming out of that, I'm going to have a one junction for the velocity of point E in the x direction. And because this is uh, body fixed coordinates, that'll be a velocity expressed in terms of the fixed frame zero. Here's velocity of E in the y direction, frame zero. And I want that to be a fixed pinpoint. So I'll simply put, I could either put a flow source on there, which would cause a causal conflict and derivative causality inside the body, or I could just put a stiff spring there. Okay. So that's a stiff spring. Uh, I'm omitting for clarity the fact that you could, you would typically put a, a parasitic resistance in parallel there on the same one junction. All right. So here are my stiff springs that form essentially the pin joint at E. Okay, so put a line around that. That is the pin at E. All right. Now the other hinge point or the other uh, velocity that's going to come out of this body is the velocity of the pin point F where it joins on to uh, portion of the the rod VFY and VFF VFX and those are also in uh, coordinates uh, frame 0 okay now if I run the simulation now I should see body 3 uh, just falling like a, a pendulum all right now I'm going to go to the other extreme extremity of the mechanism I'm going to take care of this tube body 2a so I'm going to use body fix coordinates for that one go down here to the end and let me see body 2a again represented as one of these submodels what's going to come off of that is the velocity of dx that'll be in frame 2 and velocity of dy in the body 2 fixed y direction now I want this point D to also have zero velocity and regardless of what coordinate frame I'm in, zero is zero. So I could just do pin D by putting in some of these stiff springs. All right, and I will indicate that I have pin D. All right. Now the other point on that tube was going to be the velocity of H A. Now, I, because I've drawn this bond graph before and I, I sort of know how tangly it's going to get, I'm going to draw V H A X and Y. You know, not X above Y, but like that, and that's fine. There's no uh, real correspondence between the spatial orientation of the bond graph elements and the system itself. These are also in frame 2. And I'm also going to pull 
omega of body 2a out of my body 2a submodel and establish a one junction for that. All right. Now the third body that I'm going to need is I'm going to need body 2b, which is the rod, and one end of that's going to have point F, which has to be pinned to point F on the boom, and I need point HB, which has a relative velocity compared to the point on the tube, which we've already discussed. So body 3, body 2A, and I'll do body 2B up here. So body 2B, another generic submodel. And I'm going to move that. I need space for something up there. Oh, that should be fine. So coming out of this, I'm going to have a one junction for omega 2b. Angular velocity. Uh, I'm going to have a one junction for the velocity of hb in the y direction. That's in the local frame. And over here, I'll have the velocity of HB in the local X direction. Now I, I can start putting in the joint constraints for the prismatic sliding joint rod within the tube. First I can uh, subtract, I can use a zero junction, I can subtract VAHAX from VHVX and I can define the place where I'm going to put in my actuation force. So VHBX is a zero junction. VHBX minus VHAX is going to equal V sliding, essentially. Okay. So relative velocity in the X direction. Uh, I'm going to apply a uh, effort source there. This could be from a controller. Uh, but for now, I'll just indicate that there's an effort source which gives me the actuation force, F of T. If I pull a signal out of that one junction, and if I run it into an integrator block, then I will get X sliding, which I'm going to need later on. Alright, so I've got the actuation force. Now that uh, prismatic joint should keep my two angular velocities approximately the same. And to preserve causality, I'll use a stiff spring to make omega 2b approximately equal to omega 2a. And we can see here that I'm preserving the flow out causality from the, the bodies. All right, now finally I need to do the constraint between HBY and HAY, which involves X sliding times omega 2. All right, now I'm going to establish another one junction here because all these velocity constraints, anytime I rigidly enforce one of these velocity constraints, I'm going to have a causality problem. So I'm going to make VHBY minus VHAY approximately equal to X sliding times omega 2. All right, so I'm going to take omega 2a, and I'm going to multiply it by a modulated transformer, and the lever ratio is x sliding. Okay, so now I've got x sliding times omega 2. Of course, it's this x sliding signal is going to come in here. I won't show the whole path of that because it'll clutter things up. Uh, so now what I'm saying is that, okay, with this zero junction I'm going to say that um, VHAY plus X sliding omega 2 is basically equal to VHBY. So here's VHAY plus X sliding times omega 2. That takes me to this one junction. And I'm going to make that approximately equal to VHBY with a causality generating stiff spring. Okay, flow out of the body, flow out of there. Causality's all good. All right. 
So now what I have, if I run this simulation, I should have a pendulum for the horizontal boom that would you know, oscillate under gravity. And I should have the rod inside the tube, which would also act like a pendulum falling about point D. And, uh, you know, depending on the actuation force, the rod's going to fly out of the tube. All that's remaining now is for me to take care of the pin connection at point F. Coming out of body 2B, I am going to have velocity of F on 2B in the Y direction. And that's in frame 2. Make that one junction a little bit bigger. And I'm not happy with that labeling. Do that. And that. Okay, that's a little better. And I'm also going to have the velocity of F on 2B in the local X direction. Now I can't just make the velocity of F on one body equal to the velocity of F on the other body if those velocities are expressed in different coordinate frames. For example, if I had a velocity vector like this, and if the inertial frame has that i and j orientation, well, I'm going to have like a v cos 45 in the i and a v sine 45 in the j. I'm going to have two you know, pretty much equal non-zero components of that vector in i and j, inertial i and j. If I take the same vector, and if I2J2 happens to be in this particular orientation, then instead of V looking like you know, a non-zero VX and a non-zero VY, this vector is, the same vector is going to be all the V in the I direction and nothing in the J direction. So this vector in frame 2 is going to be V0. And in the other frame, I would have had, you know, V cos 45 and V sine 45. So I can't simply equate the vector components if they're done in different frames. I need to do a coordinate transformation. And I think the easiest coordinate transformation for me to do would be to transform the velocity of F on body 2B. I'm going to transform that from uh, body fixed into inertial. So I want to transform it so I have V of F on body 2B in the X direction inertial coordinates and V F on 2B Y. And I'm going to do that with with all these transformers. So there's a rotation matrix which involves four modulated transformers. Uh, something cos theta times Vx plus something sine theta times Vy. And over here there will be another two modulated transformers. I'll take that and I will add it to that. Alright, and at the end of the day here are my causalities propagating through those one junctions. With this coordinate transformation, I will have transformed the velocity of point F on the rod into uh, inertial coordinates. Now once I have the velocity of F2 and the velocity of F both in the same coordinate frame, then I can make them equal or approximately equal with my parasitic elements. All right, so what I've just drawn there is essentially the pin at F. And what I have here is a coordinate transformation. And these four modulated transformers give me a rotation matrix, which basically looks like one of those matrices, which lets us transform uh, 
a vector from one frame to another. All right, so that's it. That is the shop crane bond graph in its entirety. And a 20 sim model demonstrating that is posted on the uh, course website. I've just added a constant actuation force trying to push the rod away from the, uh, the tube. And here's what I get. So in conclusion, given the rigid body submodels we have uh, and the velocity constraints, once we understand those, then uh, we can chain all these bodies together into whatever mechanism we want. Knowledge of the body fix coordinate system is essential if you want to do rotating sliding joints like in the shop crane.